Hey guys, we're going to do the uh, review for the upcoming circular motion and the gravitation test. So let's go ahead and start, get started with number one from the review. Um, astronomers discover a planet orbiting a nearby star. Its period of rotation is 17 Earth years, while its radius is 45 AU. AU is a unit of measure um, for things that are really, 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 really far away. It stands for astronomical unit. Um, you don't need to know that for this problem. Just know that it's some distance. Uh, technically, an AU is the average distance of the sun to the Earth. Uh, it's called an one astronomical unit. Um, anyway, this problem uh, is talking about period and radius. So for that, we're going to look at our equations that we derived in class. And that was a t squared equals 4 pi squared r cubed over big G, big M. I think I got that right. Um, doesn't really matter. Um, this, this question is tricky. Um, there's an easy way and a long way. I'm going to tell you the easy way because who cares about the hard way, the long way, right? Let's see the easy way. There's, the easy way is it's something called Kepler. It's one of Kepler's laws. Uh, one of Kepler's laws, I forget which one, it talks about this ratio between uh, orbital bodies in the same system. If you have a, a star, let's just say, for example, um, called the sun, and you have two planets, one's here with mass uh, m, and one's out here, and it's got, you know, mass of 3m or whatever, and it has an orbit around the sun, and it's got an orbit around the sun, okay. Um, they're, they have a ratio, because they're in the same system. Uh, one planet's ratio of its t squared over t squared over its r cubed ratio must equal the other planet's ratio of t squared over r they have to have the same ratio, okay? It's one of Kepler's laws. I don't know which one. Um, and it makes sense, right? Since, since the sun is kind of the... Remember, the, the what controls the orbits of, of planets and orbital bodies isn't the object in orbit. It's a thing that's being orbited, right? So since both objects are orbiting the same star in this case, their masses don't really make a difference, right? But what does matter is how far away they are, and that's going to affect the period, right? So this ratio must be maintained, right? The, whatever the ra uh, one planet is like, you know, planet A, this is planet B. They have they have to equal each other, uh, the ratio. And basically, what it's saying is, uh, the longer away you get, the further away you get, uh, that's going to make the time, the period, even even longer. So it's t squared over r cubed equals t squared over r cubed for the different. Oh, I did planet A and planet A. I meant to say planet A and planet B. Excuse me. All right, so let's look at what's going on here. So we have this planet. It says a period of rotation of 10 Earth years. All right, so our time is going to be in seven Earth years instead of, you know, Mercury years. And our radius is in AU. Okay. Well, one planet has a period of 17 Earth years and a radius of 45 AU. And the other planet, and that must equal the other planet's ratio. Other, uh, another newly discovered planet in the same system, so same ratio, has an orbital radius of only 6 AU, so its orbital radius is 6, and we're looking for its period. Now, these numbers are going to be squared up top, t squared over r cubed. And you can kind of imagine where this comes from. If you look at our, we have t squared here and r cubed. And so basically, uh, since big G and big M, that's coming from the sun. Big G always stays the same, right? That's the gravitational constant of the universe. Big M is the mass of the star and the heart of the system. And of course, pi is a constant. So you can, uh, see how kind of how this ratio might come about. Um, but anyway, so it, you get this here, and we basically from this point it's just arithmetic. We're just going to plug in the numbers and do the math. So we're going to have uh, let's see, 17 squared. That is 289. So we have 289 right up here over 45 cubed. It's going to be a pretty big number. 45 cubed. That is 91,125. Oh, equals t squared over 6 cubed, 6 times 6 is 36, times 6, 216. So the left-hand side here is going to be 289 divided by 91,125 times 216, right? Times 216. And then I'm going to, is that t squared? Do the math here. Multiply by 216 both sides. Just doing the algebra. I get about 0 0.6. Eight five. I square both sides. I don't want c squared. I want just straight up t. So I square root that, and I get about zero point eight. Zero 
one, two, three. And since my, uh, the unit I was in before was years, uh, the ratio, then my answer will also be in years, right? Since I started in years and I didn't, I didn't change units. So this ratio is, is handy because, uh, whatever units you're in, that'll be the units of your answer. Just make both, just make sure both sides of your, of your ratio are in the same unit. So I don't have one side in years and one side in hours. That, that'll work. All right. So that's, that's one of Kepler's laws. Um, I forgot which one, but you can look it up if you're interested. Um, there's going to be a problem like this tomorrow. So, uh, good, good to have handy. All right. Uh, okay. Let's move on to the second one. An object on the end of a string is swung around in the circle of radius r. It has some velocity v. If the radius of the string is increased to 4r, but the centripetal force is the same as before, what is its new velocity? Express answer in terms of v. All right, so we have an object of the radius on end of a string. Radius r, well, you don't know the mass, so this so is called mass m. We don't really know the mass. Uh, if the radius of the string is increased to 4r, but fc is the same as before. Okay, so fc, centripetal force, cannot change. So for four, it was a mass times velocity squared over r. That's one of our equations. Um, let's see. So the radius is getting four times bigger, but the centripetal force is the same as it was before. So if this is getting times four bigger, and this has to stay the same times one, right? It's not changing. In other words, move one by one, not changing. The mass isn't changing. It's staying the same times one. What do we have to do to the velocity to keep this ratio intact? Keep this fraction from changing. If I multiply velocity times four times bigger, then four squared, that doesn't look very good. Let me fix that. Times four times bigger. Then four squared is 16. If 16 over four, that means my force is going to get four times bigger, right? Because I'm going to have 16 over four. I don't have four times bigger four. So I can't have that happen. I need, I need to have my force must stay the same. What if I multiply by two? If I multiply by two, then 2 squared is 4. I get 4 times 1. The mass isn't changing. Over 4. That's 4 over this 4. Well, 4 over 4 is 1. So that's going to keep my ratio the same, right? This, the system, the, even though my velocity will go up because the, the string got longer, that'll keep my force the same as well. So think about what's happening, right? It's not always about plugging in numbers, guys. You got to think about what's happening to the system when we just change things around, right? Forget numbers. Just think about the coefficients. What if we make V 4 times bigger? Or three times bigger, or half as big, right? What happens to, uh, you know, the, the ratio of these things? So, the answer is two v, because if I multiply v by two times bigger, then because it's being squared, it'll actually be four times bigger because two squared is four, which will kind of cancel out the fact that I have a four times bigger radius. That'll keep my force the same because it said it had to be the same as four, so everything will balance out. All right, so the answer is two v. All right. A coin is placed on a turntable and spun around without, without sliding. What is the force responsible for the centripetal force? Remember, centripetal force, centripetal just means the direction is in, right? It's not a type of force. So different things cause centripetal force. If you have a ball on a string and you're twirling it around your head, then the tension force is responsible for the centripetal force. If you have a planet like the Earth in orbit around the sun, then the gravitational force is responsible for the centripetal force. Uh, because it's the one pulling it towards the center of the circle. If you have a car going around a, a curve in a road, all right, here's my car, yeah, that's a car, whatever, then the friction force is responsible for the centripetal force. So different forces are responsible, responsible for the centripetal force. Centripetal just means the direction. So in this case, it's a coin on a turntable. Well, there's no tension. There's no, we're not, gravitate, gravity's not going to do anything here because we're not in space and objects are too small. But what about friction? Friction is going to cause the force towards the center, right? It's going to keep it from sliding. In fact, it's not just friction, it's, a, it's static friction, right? Because it's not sliding. It's going to prevent it from sliding, so that's static friction. An astronaut of mass 60 kilograms is in orbit 500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. If the Earth has a radius of 6,371 kilometers, not meters, and a mass of 5.972 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, what is the centripetal acceleration of the astronaut experiences due to his gravitational force? All right. Acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. Now, the force in this case is the force of gravity. So we got to figure out what the force of gravity is by using this equation. And then plug that force, whatever we get, into this force, divided by his mass, and we should have an acceleration. 
a lot of numbers to punch in here, but basically, uh, also you'll make sure you're in the right units. Now, the, the standard unit for mass is kilograms, so we're good there. All our masses are in kilograms and kilograms. Seems good. However, the units for distance must be in meters. You must be in meters. You see kilometers, multiply by a thousand, you get to meters. If you see centimeters, divide by a hundred, right? You've got to know how to convert from to the right units of distance. Now, both of these units are in uh, kilometers. 500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, and the radius of the Earth is 500 or that many kilometers. So remember, we measure, there's the Earth, we measure, and there's the astronaut in space, we measure uh, the distance from the very center of the planet, or whatever the object is, to the other op center of the other object, right? So we want to measure, in this case, uh, the distance r is going to be the radius of the planet that much plus this many kilometers, right? Because he's that far off the surface of the Earth. So our radius r will be 6371 plus 500. And that's in kilometers, so 6871 kilometers times a thousand to get into meters so it's six eight seven one that many meters so what i want you to do is practice in your calculator you know big g is going to be six point six seven one times ten to the negative eleven uh, looks like a seventeen negative eleven times sixty that's the mass of one object right times the other mass that's the mass of the earth point point nine seven two this is times here Pen's going crazy. Uh, times 10 to the 24th power. All that divided by this number here squared, right? And that should give you the force. Take the answer there. Plug it in up, up in here, like we said before. Divide by the mass, which was 60 for the guy, right? And then find your acceleration. Oddly enough, you can also find the acceleration on the Earth caused by the astronaut if you want to just plug in the mass of the earth here and you get the acceleration newsflash it's going to be really really small because the earth is huge but anyway you should get about i think it's 8.4 meters second squared or 8.5 something like that 8 point something i forgot the exact number but it's about 8.4 8.5 uh all right so that should be your answer okay hope that makes sense in the next one if astron astronauts were experiencing an acceleration then why do they experience weightlessness? Okay, because they are in free fall. They're in free fall. They're free falling. Okay. Uh, yeah, they experience an acceleration, but so does everything else around them. Right? They're all falling, and when you're all falling, you can't, you don't feel your weight because you have nothing to press off on. Right? Nothing to, nothing to, no solid ground to to, to rest on. Right? There's no normal force. Um, so that's why, because you're free falling. If the Earth has a mass of 3x what it is now, okay, and you were in orbit two times farther away from the Earth, what would be the acceleration you would feel due to the gravitational pull on the Earth? Okay. Uh, this, we get a little 1, so we got 1 times 1 times 1 over 1 squared. Remember, this equation comes from our uh, equation, this guy here. Um, so the, make everything a 1. Now, how did it change? Okay, well, I don't care what the mass of the Earth is. I just want to know how it changes, right? Is this equation will tell me how much the acceleration changes, not, not what it is, right? So I got one. Big G never, never changes. It's always big G because it's the constant in the universe. One mass is three times bigger. The mass of the Earth, three times bigger. My mass is the same. My mass doesn't change, so I have that a one. So one, one mass gets three times bigger. Other mass stays the same. I'm two times farther away, so... 2 times for the way squared, over the square, 3 over 2 squared is 4, 3 and 3 fourths. Now that means I'm going to multiply that by what it was. Well, it was 10, right? 10 uh, meters second squared on the Earth. G is 10, so I get 7.5 meters per second squared. Technically, I get 7.5 um, kilograms per Newton, um, but when you plug that into acceleration, um, I get 7.5 meters second squared. All right. Next, a car of mass 4m and a car of mass m go around the same circular track. The smaller car has velocity of 2v. The larger car has a velocity of just v. Compared to the static friction f experienced by the smaller car, the friction on the larger car must be what? All right. Well, this one, we know that they're not skidding, right? So that means that the force of friction 
is a centripetal force here. Uh, all right, so it's a source, source of static friction. Must be mv squared over r. Uh, let's see, a car mass for it. Where am I going to assume some tracks? I want a car. I'll see that. Type of force for an F for the small car. Friction. Okay, so the small car has got this is equal to F. So what is it for the bigger car? All right, well, on the small car, um, we have mass of just M, right? So think of that as like times 1M. And the velocity, which is being squared, is like times 2. They're both the same, or go around the same track, so let's call it just R. It's going to be times 1. So this really is saying, that, like, what, think of this as like almost 4F. Now we're calling it F, right? We're calling it F, but it's it kind of like the, the numbers in here are like, it must be 4 because the velocity is being squared. It's 2V is being squared. But that, that, this is going to be equal to just F, right? Let's keep going and let's, you'll see where I'm getting, where I'm, where I'm taking this. Now the bigger car, force of friction, static, for big car, that's going to be equal to, all right, same equation, mv squared over r. Now r is the same, it's times 1. The bigger car is a mass of 4m, it's 4m there, times 4. Its velocity is just, larger car's velocity of v, so it's just v is times 1, right? Now 1 squared is 1. So I get four again here, and I got four there, and I got four there. So what do you think? If they're both four, we called this, we called that just F, right? We called it F. So isn't this just also just F? So it's the same force. Whoa, I don't know what I just did. Hit a button. Same force, right? We don't, again, we don't know what the actual force is, but all the coefficients in here, come out to be 4. And so does this one. Also come out to be 4. So whatever the mass and velocity is, doesn't matter. Because they're both going to be the same. If you plug in the numbers. Um, so there you go. Same force. The coefficient's the same. The ratio is the same. 4 to 4. So the same. All right. A ball on a string experiences a vertical uniform circular motion. At the bottom of the loop, the tension in the rope is 20 newtons. Alright, let's draw for everybody diagram. Here we got a ball. And at the bottom of the loop, the tension is straight up, and it's the bottom of the loop, right? It's going around and around and around. At the bottom, tension is up and weight is down. The tension at the bottom of the loop is 20 newtons up, and the weight force down, mg equals 8 newtons. What is the centripetal acceleration of the ball at the bottom of the loop? Centripetal acceleration is equal to v squared over r. Uh, we also know that centripetal force is mv squared over r or just ma, centripetal acceleration. So any of those, let's see which one we're going to use here. We have our net force. So I think we're going to use, oh, there's a net force. I guess you write net force. I think it look the right way. So we're not going to use this because we got to include, what is happening? We got to include uh, our forces. So that's not, this equation is not going to be enough for us, right? We got to include the forces. Now we know the net force is 12, right? Because 20 minus 8 is 12. Uh, they're in opposite directions, so we subtract. So we have 12 newtons of net force. I think we're going to use this guy because we don't really care about the velocity, of the radius, do we? It's only asking us for the acceleration. So we don't know. We don't know what a or v is. I think we're going to use this equation since we're just looking for a, right? Now, what is the mass of this thing? Well, we know that weight equals mg. The weight is 8 newtons. G is 10. Solve for m. M is 8 over 10, that's 0.8. This would be 0 0.8 times A. I'm right, going off this equation here now. Remember, I got the 12 by subtracting 20 minus 8, since they're both forces in opposite directions. That's my net force, right? All the forces on the object. Divide by 0.8. Solve for A here. A equals 15 meters per second squared. Well, hold on. I want to express my answer in terms of G. Well, G is 10. So how many g's is one point is fifteen? It's one point five g's. If g is ten, and I imagine you plugged in ten for g, when you get fifteen, you get the same answer, right? So this and this are equivalent. They're the same thing. It's just in this way I'm expressing it in terms of g. That's all. all right. Okay, we talked about this one in class a lot, but then there are actually two. Acceleration vectors, right? There are just draw a free body diagram for the roller coaster at that point. We have the normal the normal force of the of the uh uh what do you call it? 
roller coaster, the rail, right, itself, pushing off, let's do this in green, pushing off uh, in this direction, normal force, but there's also the weight of the car, right, pulling down. So there's both here, okay, it has both, normal force and weight, and they, and since force and acceleration are best friends, right, so I'm going to have an acceleration going this way, and acceleration going, going down. Now the net acceleration is centripetal. It is sort of the center of the circle. But the, there are components, right? There are, there's a small acceleration down and then a big acceleration towards the center. And if you combine those, add up the vectors and all that stuff, the total acceleration would be towards the center of the circle. But there is a small component going down because of the weight force. So the answer is to the right, right? Or, i.e. into the center, right? Into center. And then we have, the one going down because of the weight force. Okay. Hope that, hope that makes sense. All right. Let's go to the next one. Um, get back in the black here. Right. Two bugs are on a risk. Okay. Uh, now this, this, okay. <laughs> this, uh, this express, this problem is actually kind of, I, I shouldn't have put it on here and put it that way. It, it's not necessary right now, but I'll go and explain it real, real quickly just because. Maybe some of you are curious. Are curious. Um, we discussed briefly last week that if you have, if you're on a circle, let's say it's like a record player, okay, or a CD player, or whatever, and here's this, here's a center, and you have two uh, spots. You got a spot right here, all right, and you got a spot uh, on towards the edge, right there, right. And I said they both they both or, go around the circle. Now, it's a CD or record or whatever is spinning, and it's going around the circle like this, and the red one's going around. Going around like this. Now I think you would we can all agree that the uh the they both take the same amount of time to orbit to go to, to, to make one revolution, right? Because they're both they're both on the same disc or the same record or whatever. However, I think you can agree that the red point covers much less ground. It doesn't go as far, it doesn't travel as much distance, right, as the green spot does. So the further away you are from the center of the circle, the faster your velocity is, right? We talked briefly about this last week, I believe. However, let's say at this point and this point, right, it takes the same amount of time for to kind of sweep out this angle for whether you're on the red dot or the green dot. Now the green dot moves faster through space, but the red dot and the green dot both cover this the same 90 degree angle in the same amount of time. Now the 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 change in how much angle you sweep out over time is something called angular velocity. That's represented by the kind of this funky W. All right. Now there's an easy way to um, convert between angular velocity, uh, which is measured in radians per second, and linear or tangential velocity, which is meters per second, and then simply the velocity equals r omega, which conversely means that omega equals v over r. Um, and since if you're getting a three times bigger radius and your omega is the same because you're, you're on the same disc with each bug is on the same uh, turntable, since your radius is three times larger, you're going to have, this is not, this is the same, right? Times one. This, this doesn't change. Then you're going to have a three times, you must have a three times bigger velocity, right? So the answer here is three V. Um, and that's why, because of this relationship between radius and, um, and, and velocity, All right? So, yeah, shouldn't have really probably been on this uh, review, <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's think of it as a, a tiny glimpse into the rotation unit, which we'll be doing next semester. So, anyway, all right, let's go to the next problem. An object is attached to the end of a string as it moves in a circular fashion at constant speed. The direction of velocity and acceleration vectors are, all right, if you are in circular motion, whether you are in space or on a string or around a corner in a car, doesn't matter. If you are going in a circle at constant speed, then... So you're right here, and then that means that your acceleration is centripetal. Your force is centripetal, and your velocity, whoa, that's bad. Try that again. Your velocity is tangential, which means it's that, excuse me, special line that can only touch circle at one spot. So if we were to let, if this is a string, right, we let go, it's always going to take that path, right? It's always going to take that, we call it the inertial path or the tangent path, right? If, it's, if I'm in this spot, my centripetal acceleration is towards the center of the circle, and my tangential velocity is this way. If I'm at this spot, 
tangential velocity, whoa, tangential velocity down this way, like something like that. If I'm at this spot here, velocity is tangent. And if I let go of the string at that spot, it would fly out this direction. All right, we'll go off that way. My acceleration is always towards center, as is the force, right? They're both centripetal. Okay. Planet A is one fourth the size of planet Earth with half the mass of Earth. But what is the acceleration due to gravity on planet A? All right, well, acceleration due to gravity on planet on Earth is 10. So how does this compare to planet A? Okay. All right, well, this is a rule of one problem. Start off with all my ones. Big G can't change, so it stays a one. Uh, this planet is one fourth the size of the Earth, so its mass is a quarter. Oh no, so much. Oh, that's radius. Sorry. Okay, just kidding. Uh, its mass is half, however. The other object on the planet doesn't matter, right? This could be me or you or a ball or a car or whatever. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna say that doesn't change. This is gonna be stay a one. So remember, you need two masses, right? One's the mass of the planet that's being halved here. The other is the mass of thing on the planet. It's just not gonna. That doesn't matter what it is, right? Car, bowling ball, you, me, whatever. Divided by the radius. So it says it's one quarter the size of the planet. It means it has quarter the radius, right? Quarter the, quarter the distance from the center of the Earth to the, um, the surface. So one fourth squared, don't forget. So we get one half over one sixteenth, which I believe is eight. If my math is good, I will check because I always check. Yes, eight. Now, okay. If 8 times what it was, the answer is not 8. This is a factor of change, right? It's, it's telling us how the relationship changes, right? If you make all these changes to some planet, you're going to have 8 times more than whatever it was before, right? Because it was, it was, we're changing the changes based on what Earth is like. Well, on Earth, it's 10. So times 8 gives you, what's 8? 80 meters a second squared. So yeah, you're going to be crushed on this planet. Don't go, don't go to that planet. You're going to die, right? You know, if you send it's eight G's, right? Eight G's of gravity, like, all the time. So that's not good. You'll die. So don't go there. All right. A car goes along a circular track with a diameter of 300 meters. At the moment, the car's velocity is west. All right, so we're moving west, and the uh, and the acceleration is south. Okay, so right here, then, right? That means the acceleration is south this way. Central acceleration. And velocity is this this direction. Uh, with an acceleration of four. Okay, so my centripetal acceleration is four. Write that down. What is the speed of the car and what direction around the circle is it moving? Alright, so I have my velocity, or my radius, I mean here. My radius is 300 meters. And I have my velocity for, our acceleration is four, rather. Oh, I know centripetal acceleration is v squared over r, right? Can I just plug in my numbers here and solve for v? So I know that V squared, if I just rearrange this, times R both sides, is A times R. I square root both sides, get rid of that squared sign. So V is the square root of centripetal acceleration times R. R is 300. A was 4. So 300 times 4. Oops. 300 times 4 is 12,100. Yeah. So V, I square root that. So it's the square root of 1200, 330, is something wrong here? I feel like, because that's not the answer I got before. What did I do wrong? I feel like the answer I was getting in class was, ah, diameter. <laughs> radius is 150. Yep, see, it happens to the best of us. All right, so radius is 150. Good catch, everybody. Why do you caught that today in class, anyway? Uh, times four. All right, so 600. Square root of 600 is 24 and a half. There we go. 24.5. And since I know my velocity is to the left here, acceleration is down. Based on, on the description, I'm going this direction around, which is counterclockwise, right? Because the clock goes, well, the clock, clock would go, take, many hand takes this way, right? But it's going this way, so it's counterclockwise. 24 and a half meters a second. Okay, a couple more. Two cars, one with mass m, the other car with mass 3m, travel around the, the same unbanked circular road. Uh, one car, car of mass m, okay, so car of mass m has a velocity of 2v. Um, okay, a car of mass 3m has, oops, 3m, has a velocity of v, 1v. 
The frictional force required to keep the larger car on the track without skidding is... All right, so we have two cars. It's the same unbanked six So same R for both, right? Same R. Same R here. So let's see. What What is... Uh, in terms of F, I uh, didn't write the question very well. Remember, I think I told you all today in class that I was a little tired about this one. So let's say this is F. This is F. So what? how many Fs will it take for the big car, right? Now, again, keep this in mind. What's the ratio here? Well, you have 1M times 1 here, right? 2V, so that's... Uh, I'll put the square to this side. All right, the equation I'm using here is centripetal force equals mv squared over r. So I'm going to square this guy. So if it's 2v. Let me, you know what? Let me, let me just let me do this differently. Ah, racer. Just a little differently there. Okay, so for the small car with mass m, the force F is mv squared over or R, but we're multiply it's 2v, right? 2v. So this is actually times 2. But don't forget it's squared, right? Okay, so that's actually going to be like a ratio of 4 over 1. Since R doesn't change, and M it says it's just mass is just M. So it's times 1. Now this guy is 3m, and the velocity is just V, so that's just times 1. So 1 squared is still just 1. So it's 3 over times 1. Radius hasn't changed for either one. So this is 3 to 4. 3 here, 4 there. How do we... Alright, so yeah, if we have 3 here and 4 there, right? Sorry. Huh. So if we have 3 here and 4 there, like I was saying, uh, what's the ratio? And the ratio is 3 over 4. So your answer will be 3 fourths F. Alright, that's 3 fourths, um, 3 fourths, or 75%, if you think about it that way, 75% of the force on the big car to keep it uh, not sliding or skidding on the car as it does the smaller car because the smaller car is going faster, right? So three force the force on the big car as the small car. So whatever the force was, uh, where's that? Whatever the force was for the small car, let's say it was a hundred, then it would be th you would only need seventy-five newtons on the bigger car to keep it not skidding as it goes around the corner, all right? So this this idea, see, I've been several times I've done this, haven't I? Where I've kind of said, okay, well, if I make this change here and multiply by two, and it's squared, so it's a four, and then I do this side here, and it's okay, now it's a three, whatever. Then you notice this is kind of a theme here, right? So I hope this is making sense, and you're gonna see how you compare the two and make a ratio or you know some sort of um, you know uh, comparison, and have to make sense. So I think that's the last problem. Yep. So uh, that's all the problems in the review. So. Um, you know, go over it, watch the video, uh, mess with me with any questions. I'm sorry it's so late. It didn't get home until a while and, you know, I've been making the video. It took me about 30 minutes. So, hope it's, hope it helps. Um, mess with me on your mind. Have any problems? Tomorrow, remember, multiple choice test and the FRQ was a take home, which was due the next day. So, um, yeah. Hope it helps, guys. See you all tomorrow. Have a great day.